Lecture 9 Judaism on Death and the Afterlife In 2004, a sharp disagreement about the afterlife in Judaism began with a statement on National Public Radio's Morning Edition. In the course of reporting a story, correspondent Nina Totenberg, who's Jewish, stated that Jews do not believe in an afterlife. Michael Medved, an Orthodox Jewish talk show host, responded that her statement was, quote, a slander to all believing Jews everywhere. That's quite a strong reaction to a comment that was undoubtedly an overgeneralization, but certainly wasn't meant to be slanderous. But let's assume that Medved just meant, yes, Jews do believe in an afterlife. Which statement is true? In keeping with the long Jewish tradition of diversity of opinion and debate, the answer is both. Among the adherents of the three Abrahamic faiths, Jews today are certainly, on a statistical basis, the least concerned with the afterlife. This is true in both America and Israel, which combined have around 83% of the world's Jewish population. According to surveys in recent years, between 38 and 46% of American Jews believe in an afterlife and only 16% of them are absolutely certain about it. Some 56% of Israeli Jews said they believe in an afterlife in a 2012 survey. Contrast those figures with the 86 to 90% of American evangelical Christians, around 82% of Catholics, and 85% of American Muslims who believe in life after death. And if we look at Muslims in Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa, the overwhelming majority, between 90 and 99%, depending on the country, believe in an afterlife. Nevertheless, both belief and non-belief in an afterlife are long-standing elements of Jewish tradition. Jewish texts, rabbis, and theologians have advanced a wide variety of views about the afterlife throughout history. Belief in an afterlife declined among Jews in the post-Enlightenment modern world, and in 1970s America, only 19% of American Jews were found to believe in it. So today's figures of 38 to 46 percent, then, represent an interesting resurgence in American Jewish belief in an afterlife. So let's take a closer look at Jewish views on death and what may follow it, how they developed over time, and how they shape Jewish practices relating to death today. Underlying the disagreement over the afterlife in Judaism is the fact that Judaism is a religion with no single central authority. The three main forms of Judaism contain many divergent views within themselves. Orthodox Judaism sees itself as most devoted to tradition, but is further divided into many forms, including ultra-Orthodox communities that reject many aspects of modern life, and modern Orthodox Jews who accommodate much of modernity while still following the laws and ritual requirements of their tradition. Broadly speaking, Conservative Judaism is less traditional than Orthodox Judaism in matters of belief and practice, and Reform Judaism is the least tradition-bound of the three. Of the three forms, Orthodox Judaism is the one that makes most frequent reference to an afterlife, although not with anything close to the regularity of Christianity and Islam. Most practicing Jews in the West, however, belong either to the conservative or reform movements in Judaism, and it's rare that the afterlife is a major topic of sermons in their synagogues or Jewish education programs. Conservative and Reformed Jews, therefore, often don't know a lot about Judaism's treatment of the afterlife, and they're left to develop their own views on the subject. In the Hebrew Bible, God establishes a covenant with the people Israel. In this covenant, God does not promise that eternal life will be granted to them. The promise is that if the people follow God's commandments, God will grant them descendants, their people, the tribe, will flourish, and they will be given the land of Israel, the sacred center of which will be Jerusalem. The rabbinic tradition, however, features the term olam haba, the world to come. To some Jews, these words suggest an afterlife. Others interpret them as a reference to a time when a great leader, known as the Mashiach, meaning Messiah, but unlike the Christian notion, a fully human one, will come and establish justice and an end to wickedness and sin in the world. Simcha Paul Raphael, author of Jewish Views of the Afterlife, believes that some indication of early Israelite views on the afterlife can be found in the Jewish cultural custom of the family tomb. 
Raphael writes that the tomb was more than a place to assemble bodies. Burial in the family grave, Raphael writes, served to reconnect the departed one with a society of previously dead ancestors. Death itself was not seen as the cessation of existence, but a passage to another realm where departed family spirits cohabited. Abraham, upon his death in Genesis 25, 8, was said to have been, quote, gathered to his people. Moses' death was described in the same way. These patriarchs were envisioned in death as going to where their ancestors were, some form of communal, familial afterlife. Some scholars speculate that as family grew into tribe, the family tomb concept became a general underworld. In books of the Hebrew Bible, such as Psalms and Isaiah, the place people go after death is called Sheol. No detailed description of Sheol is given in the Bible, but the term seems to refer to an underworld, that is a domain beneath the earth. Sheol is described as, quote, a land of thick darkness, of shadow, nethermost pit in the deeps. There is no sense of reward or punishment there. In the King James Bible of 1611, Sheol is translated as hell, but that word gives the idea of a punitive moral dimension that's absent in the Hebrew. In certain ways, Sheol more closely resembles the ancient Greek realm of Hades. It's a pale imitation of life on earth, and one wants to avoid going there as long as possible. A passage in Ecclesiastes reads, The dead know nothing, and they have no reward. There is no work or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol. In the book of Job, Job says, Leave me a little joy before I go to the place of no return the land of murk and deep shadow, where dimness and disorder hold sway. James Carse, professor emeritus of history and literature of religion at New York University, writes of Sheol, Rather than exciting the imagination, it seems to confound it, binding one's reflections about death to thoughts of vanishing into the dust. So for the ancient Israelites, death was not a complete annihilation of life, nor did it bring reward or punishment for one's deeds. In a sense, it was the diminishment of life. Author Johannes Peterson writes that, from the Israelites' perspective, quote, life is something which one possesses in a higher or lower degree. One of the most lamentable parts of existence in Sheol is that those who dwell there forget. And one thing that is forgotten is the connection with God. According to the book of Genesis, humans are made of earth or dust, and God blows his breath into us to animate what otherwise is not alive. So once the breath is gone, the spiritual dimension of a person is also gone. In Psalm 6, a plea goes out to God. In death, there is no remembrance of you. Who can sing your praises in Sheol? Still, in the Hebrew Bible, it is clear that something persists after death, at least for some people. And some people have the ability to communicate with the dead. Jewish law forbids the use of mediums. But in the book of Samuel, Saul, the king, seeks out the so-called witch of Endor, who is a medium, to call the deceased prophet Samuel from Sheol so that Saul can ask him for advice, indicating that Samuel is still accessible in some form, and still possessed of useful knowledge. Another place in the Hebrew Bible that comes to be associated with the afterlife is Gehinom. Originally, this was a place outside of Jerusalem in which non-Jews worshipped other gods and performed child sacrifice, which led Jews to consider the area cursed. Some have speculated that fires were kept burning there to consume corpses and garbage. It was seen as an impure place, filled with death and acts that were in opposition to God's will. Between the 1st and 7th century CE, the period when rabbinic teachings were being compiled into the Jewish text known as the Talmud, Gehinom, or Gehenna in Greek, was conceived as an otherworldly place where the wicked were punished. According to the Talmud, however, such punishment was only temporary and served the purpose of purging people of their transgressions so they could atone and partake of the world to come. 
By the time of the New Testament, the word Gehenna was used to refer to something similar to the current Christian understanding of hell, a place of torment and unquenchable fire that people are cast into. The Quranic word for hell, Jahannam, is derived from the Hebrew Gehinom. At some point, the Jewish notion of a world to come became linked with the idea of the resurrection of the body after death. God would establish his righteous kingdom on earth and would raise the dead so they could dwell in it. Resurrection had clearly entered Jewish scripture and liturgy by the second century BCE. In the book of Ezekiel, God said, I am now going to open your graves. I mean to raise you from your graves, my people, and I shall put my spirit, my ruach, in you, and you will live, and I shall resettle you on your own soil. In 2 Maccabees, a non-canonical book for Jews, written around the 2nd century BCE, seven sons choose to die rather than break Jewish law. Each brother, before he dies, affirms his belief in God, and many explicitly mention resurrection. For example, the second brother says to the king, Thou indeed, O most wicked man, destroy us out of this present life. But the king of the world will raise us up, who die for his laws in the resurrection of eternal life. In the book of Daniel, thought to date to the second century BCE, a verse reads, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Interestingly, the reward of resurrection for the righteous was seen as more national than individual. Raphael writes, Resurrection promised a revival of the Jewish people as a community. It was insufficient that individuals would receive their reward alone, particularly in the context of a religion that saw its relationship with God as communal and therefore demanded national reward. Why might the belief in resurrection have become more widespread in the second century BCE? This was a period in which Jews were suffering under the yoke of occupation by the Hellenistic Seleucid Empire and the enforced practice of its polytheistic religion. Under such circumstances, the notion of a world to come may have provided solace. Robert Goldenberg, professor of history and Judaic studies at Stony Brook University in New York, writes, Because of suffering inflicted upon the Jewish people, they were forced to change their beliefs. Those who kept to the old traditions were being tortured, while those who converted to Greek ways were rewarded. And this caused a shift, as divine reward could not be given to both peoples. Thus it was said that those who remained loyal to the Torah would rise one day to enjoy eternal life. Disagreements arose, however, over resurrection's validity. In the latter part of the Second Temple period that ended in 70 CE, there was a debate between Pharisees, who believed in resurrection, and Sadducees, who argued that the soul perishes along with the body and that there is no afterlife. The Jewish scholar Josephus wrote, As for the persistence of the soul after death, penalties in the underworld, and rewards, the Sadducees will have none of them. Elsewhere he wrote, The Sadducees hold that the soul perishes along with the body. In spite of its detractors, the concept of resurrection survived, and its promise took on clear importance in Judaism. The Mishnah, a portion of the Talmud that was compiled around 200 CE, states that the one who says that the resurrection of the dead is a teaching that does not derive from the Torah does not have a share in the world to come. So significant was the idea that it was woven into the Amidah, the central Jewish prayer recited by observant Jews three times a day. In its traditional form, the prayer proclaims God's power to revive the dead, and the belief endured. In the 12th century, the revered Jewish philosopher Moshe ben Maimon, known as Maimonides, wrote that the resurrection of the dead is a basic principle of the Torah of Moses. It's important to note that the ancient Jewish understanding of resurrection differed from the belief held by people of different faiths today in disembodied souls rising to heaven. As we've seen, ancient Jews saw the individual as an integral whole made up of an earthly body and an animating spirit or soul. They envisioned the body and soul as being resurrected together. The soul might be temporarily separated from the body, 
Some Jews believe the souls of the righteous wait in Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, or Paradise, for the resurrection, while souls that needed cleansing of sin await in Gehinom. But resurrection at the end time, with the coming of the Mashiach and the establishment of the kingdom of peace, will fully restore us by reuniting our souls with our bodies. Between the 13th and 18th centuries, the Greek belief in a soul that survives death without a body became increasingly prominent among Jews. Within Reform Judaism in particular, there's a tendency to minimize or eliminate supernatural elements. For this reason, belief in resurrection isn't common. Those Reform Jews who do believe in an afterlife are more drawn to the notion of an immortal soul. The 1885 Pittsburgh Platform, an important document in Reform Jewish history, states, We reassert the doctrine of Judaism that the soul is immortal, grounding the belief on the divine nature of human spirit. Today, the Jewish memorial prayer recited at the end of a funeral contains phrases such as, the memory of his soul, the request that God protect her soul, and the plea that God merge her soul with eternal life. Reincarnation, another idea often associated with other worldviews, also developed as a belief in Judaism although it's always been a minority view. Its source is unclear, but the first evidence for a Jewish belief in reincarnation appears in the 12th century. It is most often seen in Jewish mysticism, or Kabbalah, in Hasidism, a form of pietistic Orthodox Judaism, and in the Yiddish literature of diaspora Jews in Europe. The Hebrew word for reincarnation is Gilgal, which means cycle. The idea is that the soul goes through cycles of birth and death. Early Kabbalists believed that reincarnation only happened to the wicked, so they would be able to cleanse themselves of sin, while the souls of the righteous waited in a paradise-like realm for resurrection. In later periods, all people were believed to undergo reincarnation, so everyone had a chance at spiritual improvement. After all, how many of us get it right in one life? Among some Jews, it's believed that the soul always takes human form, but others believe that it can be reborn in animal forms. In either case, though, each life allows a person to move closer to God until he or she is cleansed of sin, able to fulfill all of God's commandments, and united with God, at which point the cycles end. In light of the long-standing presence of the afterlife as an idea in Jewish thought, how did Nina Totenberg and many other modern Jews get the idea that it has no place in Judaism? One explanation is that there are texts within the Hebrew Bible that seem to suggest that death is the end of us. Psalm 144 reads, God, what is man that you are mindful of him? Man's life is a breath of wind. His days are a shadow that passes away. Psalm 146 tells us, Man gives up his breath and goes back to the earth from which he came. And on that day, all his purposes perish. James Carse argues that the books of the Hebrew Bible that contain the deepest discussions of death, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Proverbs, are alike in their, quote, unwillingness to look for a continuation of life after death. In fact, there are also remarkably few passages in the Hebrew Bible that deal with the afterlife at all. To a large extent, however, the Jewish stance of non-belief or agnosticism toward an afterlife is a result of a rationalism that originated in the Enlightenment. Reform Judaism, which was established in Germany in the early 19th century, embraced rationalism and modernity and sought to put Judaism's long history of persecution and isolation behind it. In Reform Judaism, for instance, that 1885 Pittsburgh platform stated, we reject as ideas not rooted in Judaism the beliefs both in bodily resurrection and in Gehenna and Eden, you know, hell and paradise, as abodes for everlasting punishment and reward. The inclination against the supernatural was reflected in the Reform prayer book, which Reform Jews used during services. Cantor Sherry Allen points out that in the Amidah, the ancient Jewish prayer I mentioned earlier, God was described as Michaye Hametim, that is, the one who gives life to the dead. In the Reform book, Gates of Prayer, released in 1975, however, 
the phrase was changed to Mechaye Hakol, which means the one who gives life to all, thereby avoiding any mention of resurrection. In the version of the prayer book released in 2007, however, the original wording is brought back in parentheses so that both options are side by side. The revision suggests that the afterlife still has a constituency, even among Reformed Jews. Jewish beliefs regarding death, in all their diversity, are naturally reflected in Jewish practices with respect to the dead. In Judaism, the body we have been given is a gift from God, and even after death, it must be treated with utmost care and respect. The proper treatment and burial of the body, acts of mourning, and remembering the dead are considered to be of great importance. Even for those who believe in the afterlife, the death of a loved one is experienced and treated as a painful loss. In the Hebrew Bible, the first thing that the patriarch Jacob did when he thought that his son Joseph had died was to tear his clothes. It became traditional for Jews to tear their clothing upon the death of a loved one. And some of those who follow this practice today do it symbolically, however, by wearing a cut or torn black ribbon on one of their lapels. From the time of death until the burial, the body of the deceased must not be left alone. A person called a shomer or guard stays with it, reading psalms, stories, or poetry that meant something to the one who has died. Candles are often placed around the body. Members of the Hevra Kadisha, volunteers from an area synagogue, help prepare the body for burial, sometimes along with family members. They wash the body of the deceased in order to purify it. Tradition calls for the body to be clothed only in a simple white burial garment, a robe-like shroud that is often made of linen and has no pockets. As the saying goes, you can't take it with you. Why well, have pockets for it? The shroud represents the idea that there are no distinctions among people in death. All are equal before God. Observant Jews will often be buried in a prayer shawl from which the fringes on one corner are removed, representing that the prayer shawl will no longer be used, which can be seen as a form of tie-breaking. From the earliest period, Jews have believed that burial rituals are among the most important religious practices and obligations. Leaving a person unburied was a profound transgression. Tradition holds that the body should either be buried directly in the ground or in a simple wooden casket. Burial should take place within 24 hours or as soon as possible after death, a necessity in the hot climate where the tradition arose. And there should be no embalming, other manipulation, or preservation of the body. Consequently, there is no viewing of the body or open casket ceremony. Traditionally, Jewish custom has the mourners themselves fill the grave following the lowering of the coffin, although this is often done symbolically by shoveling in a small amount of earth. This can be understood as a tie-breaking ritual requiring a physical act to imprint on the body and mind the reality of death. Anita Diamant writes, Helping to fill the grave means you have left nothing undone. The echo of earth falling on the wooden coffin is the terrible and haunting sound of finality. After you have emptied a shovel onto a loved one's casket, there is no denying death, which makes it possible for healing to begin. Jews who feel a powerful connection to the land of Israel may be buried there or may have soil from Israel sprinkled in their coffins so that the body is in contact with the land of Israel. Most observant Jews, certainly all Orthodox Jews, consider cremation prohibited, as they believe that the body should be allowed to decompose naturally and return to the earth of which it is made. In the modern period, cremation has become increasingly acceptable to many non-Orthodox Jews, although after the Holocaust, some Jews have seen a painful association with the fires of the crematoria. Jewish funeral home directors in various major cities give estimates ranging from 5 to 15 percent of Jews choosing cremation. The funeral itself can be held at graveside, in a synagogue, or in a funeral home. The funeral service is normally conducted by a rabbi or cantor, but this isn't required by Jewish law. The service itself is usually simple and fairly short, and it focuses on honoring the dead. The main elements of the ritual are the reading of prayers and psalms, and the giving of eulogies for the deceased. At the end of the service, a memorial prayer called 
El Malay Rahamim, is recited. The prayer asks the merciful God to give rest to the deceased and to protect his or her soul. If the funeral is not held at the graveside, the body is then carried to the burial site by pallbearers, and a short ceremony occurs at the grave. This consists of additional prayers and recitations, including the mourner's Kaddish, the Jewish memorial prayer that is repeated throughout the mourning period by members of the family. The prayer is recited in the ancient language of Aramaic, the language spoken during the time of Jesus, and most Jews will be familiar with its words, which begin, Yitkadal v'yitkadash shemei rabah. Interestingly, the words of the Kaddish are not about loss. They're not a prayer for the soul of the dead. In fact, death is not even mentioned in the prayer. Rather, the prayer praises and glorifies God. Some of the verses are as follows. Exalted and hallowed be God's great name in the world which God created according to plan. Blessed be God's great name to all eternity. This conveys the idea that God's plan includes death, and we must accept it, and despite our loss, praise God for the gift of God's creation. Even in the midst of death, we must embrace life. Judaism helps guide the bereaved through the process of grief with a series of periods that gradually lead them back to daily life, while giving them ways to continue to honor the memory of their loved one and express sadness. According to Anita Diamant, this process, quote, can be imagined as a series of concentric circles defined by the passage of the first week, the first month, the first year, and the anniversary of a death. The innermost circle is the darkest, but as the weeks pass, mourners move from the dimness of remembering and weeping to the light of rejoicing in the memory of life. The first period is one in which mourners are not ready to fully re-enter society. After the funeral, the family members begin a period of intense mourning known as sitting shiva. Shiva is Hebrew for seven, and the period traditionally lasts seven days. Friends and neighbors come to sit with the mourning family, share grief, and show support. Mourners sit on low stools so that they're closer to the ground. Rabbi Maurice Lamb explains that this is, quote, an adjustment of one's body to one's emotional state, a lowering of the human frame to the level of his feelings. In the homes of many observant Jews, mourners do not work, bathe, shave, wear jewelry, use cosmetics, have sex, or view any form of entertainment during the mourning period. A candle remains burning through the week. Mirrors in the house are covered so that mourners don't focus attention on their appearance. They recite the mourner's cottage daily, along with their other prayers, and do not leave the house except for the Sabbath when they attend synagogue. The second period of mourning, known as Shloshim, for 30, occurs in the month following burial. Mourners do not attend social gatherings during the second period, and they continue to recite the mourner's cottage daily. For those mourning the loss of parents, this period lasts for a year after death, an expression of the unique place of the parent in the life of a Jew. After that, mourners participate in memorial services four times a year as part of the observance of the Jewish holidays of Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Passover, and Shavuot. On every anniversary of the person's death, a yartzeit, or anniversary candle, is lit. The person's children, parents, spouse, and siblings recite the mourner's Kaddish, and some fast. Sometime between the second month and a full year after a loved one's death, the tombstone is unveiled. There's a short service, the words on the tombstone are read, and people often place a pebble on the grave to mark their visit. Bringing flowers isn't a Jewish tradition, although some Jews now do this. Like the second burial performed in some religions, the Jewish tombstone ritual provides a space for the mourners to think about the deceased without the emotional intensity of the funeral, which comes so soon after the death. As we have seen, Judaism encompasses a wide range of views and practices with regard to death, and in many other areas as well. But there are some aspects of the tradition that are widely shared among Jews. One is a devotion to one's family, to one's Jewish community, and to the Jewish people. And this extends to the ancestors of the past, 
especially towering figures such as Abraham and Moses, and to one's descendants, both in life and in death, Jews are connected deeply with all other Jews. Whatever happens after death, Jews know that they will be remembered by their families and communities. Leon Cass writes, Unlike the death-defying Egyptians, those ancient precursors of the quest for bodily immortality, the children of Israel do not mummify or embalm their dead. We bury our ancestors, but keep them alive in memory. And accepting our mortality, we look forward to the next generation. Indeed, the mitzvah to be fruitful and multiply, when rightly understood, celebrates not the life we have and selfishly would cling to, but the life that replaces us. In this sense, all Jews who feel linked to the Jewish people have an afterlife.